Hi, this is Chaplain Greg again uh, with the Wandering Wesleyan, welcoming you, welcoming you back to part two of our Walking in the Word series. And uh, we're still in the introduction, believe it or not. And uh, what we talked about last week, uh, we ended up talking about translations of the Bible and uh, the beginning of uh, the King James family. We talked about how the King James Version came into being. Um, but if you could please like and subscribe, like the video, subscribe to this channel, and uh, set your post notification bell, and uh, you'll be sure to get uh, notifications of when I am posting new videos, which is my, my goal is to do it every week, uh, 15 to 20 minute videos. So like and subscribe. So let's continue with our talk about uh, the King James family of Bible translations. Again, I, I love the King James and the language, and especially the Psalms. And uh, it's, it, it, it's a wonderful version of the Bible, but it's not in our English. It's in 17th century English. And if you think you're reading the 1611 Bible, um, go back to my first, video, my first introduction video and uh, it, you'll see why that's not the case. The letter J has something to do with it. Anyways, so the King James Version of the Bible. So I, I talked last week about one of my uh, most treasured Bibles that I own, and that's one uh, given to my uh, great-great-great-grandfather from my great-great-great-grandmother. And you know what they called the King James Bible back then? The Bible. There wasn't any other. There were, that was it for English. It was the Bible. Um, but about the turn of the century, uh, the, of the 18th and to, um, from the 19th to the 20th centuries, there were a bunch of different versions that started popping up. And the, re, the Revised Standard Version, which is now used the most mainline denominations, came from uh, a version called the Authorized Version, which came about in the beginning of the, the uh, 20th century. Um, the Revised Standard Version, most mainline Protestant denominations use this version right now. Um, and it's, it's fine. Uh, but those who love the King James Version wanted a version that was closely aligned with, and, and the Revised Standard Version kind of got away from that King James feel. And if you read the King James Version, or the Revised Standard Version, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so in 1982, there was a version released called the New King James Version. And uh, that was really popular amongst most evangelicals um, for, for a good long period of time. I remember using that in the 80s. That and uh, the NIV, which I'll get to in a minute. But the New King James Version updated the language didn't fix all the problems that the uh, King James Version had, but it was a solid, solid translation. Up until 2001, it was favored mostly by evangelical and reformed churches, but in 2001, the um, English Standard Version came out, the ESV, and that has been by far the most popular Bible with evangelical and reformed Christians. Uh, it is a marvelous translation. It is it, it has that feel of King James to it, but is far more readable than, um, than the King James Version is. Um, again, that was published in 2001. It's more accurate than the Revised Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, and the New King James Version. It is very accurately translated. Um, an even more updated version of uh, the King James out of the King James family is the modern English version. That was published in 2005. Uh, Charismatics and Pentecostals really like that version. Um, for some reason, it's taken hold in that, in that particular stream of Christian, uh, Christian beliefs. So ESV, MEV, both of those tremendous versions. Now, another version of the Bible that sometimes gets a little bit of a bad rap, but I think is a fine translation is the NIV, the New International Version. 
Uh, first published in 1978, it's, it was a favorite of evangelicals through the 80s and 90s and even into the 2000s. Um, this was a more dynamic translation. So instead of translating word for word, as some versions did, um, it was more thought for thought. So it was much easier to read for, especially beginning Christians, um, much easier to read, pretty reliably translated, um, I studied at Gordon College under a couple of uh, professors that did translation work for the NIV. Tremendous men of God. Um, but their, uh, the NIV was very, very popular. And right now, the 2011 version of the NIV, to me, is probably the better NIV version out there. Now, there's another version of the Bible, and this is my go-to translation. This is the one I use the most, and that's the Christian Standard Bible, which came out of the Holman uh, Christian Standard Version Bible by the Holman Group. Uh, the CSB was published in 2018, and I really, really dig, I, I dig this version. It's easy to read. It's wonderfully accurate. It has, um, in the New Testament, the Old Testament references are in bold so that you know that the author of that particular work, whether it be gospel epistle or, or whatever, you know they are quoting the Old Testament. And then when you have a reference Bible, you can go back and look at where that reference is. So the CSB, wonderfully translated, um, that's, that's the version that I use. And you'll hear me quoting most from uh, as we go through this series. Um, I also want to mention the New American Standard Bible. New American Standard Bible was published in 1971, has just been updated within the past couple of years, the 2020 version of the NASB. Um, the NASB tried to be as literal a translation as you could do with English. Um, it's really hard to do you know, word for word uh, translation and substitute between ancient Greek, ancient Hebrew, and modern English. NASB tried as best they could to do that and yet remain readable. So what do I mean by that? So I'm going to take my phone here and I'm going to go to a free app. And that free app is called the, um, yeah, let me find it here. Bible Hub. Okay. So when you go to Bible Hub, and I'm going to go to John 3.16. We all know John 3.16, right? So let's go to John 3.16. All right. Now, we all know John 3.16 to be, For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If I translated word for word, this is what it would be. Thus for loved God the world, that the Son, the only begotten, he gave so that everyone believing in him not should perish, but should have life eternal. Boy, does that sound clunky. And if you were Greek, if you were an ancient Greek reading that, that would make perfect sense to you. But to us, 21st century English-speaking American people, American for, for my side anyway, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So you gotta, you got to make it so it makes sense to you, but also remains truthful to what the text is trying to say. And the, new, and the New American Standard Bible tried to be as faithful to the Greek and to the Hebrew and the Aramaic as it could. Um, and it turned out to be a tough read. It was great for study. Great for study, but tough to read. The New American Standard 2020, much more readable. They've made it far more readable. Um, so with that, I'm going to leave translations aside and I'm going to talk a little bit about paraphrases. Now, that brings in 
the conversation uh, a translation, not a paraphrase, but a translation called the New Living Translation. Now, the New Living Translation is inspired by a paraphrased Bible called the Living Bible. And the Living Bible was a very readable paraphrase of the King James Version of the Bible. And what do I mean by paraphrase? A paraphrase is an attempt from an author to take an English version or any language that isn't the original languages version of the Bible and put their own spin on it. So the author of the Living Bible, and I, I don't have that fellow's name in front of me right now, but he took the King James and he tried to put it using the King James tried to put it in as best language as he could to make it readable. And it was very popular. I, I had a living Bible when I was a teenager. I loved the living Bible. And a, a good friend of mine right now uses the living Bible almost exclusively. It's it's fine. It's, it's a wonderful devotional read. And one of the problems, though, that the author of the living Bible saw was people were using the living Bible for study. It's not great for study because you're getting just one person's point of view, not from the original text, but from a translated text. So that's why the New Living Translation was brought about so that we could have a far more readable version of the Bible that's an actual translation. But the Living Bible, very readable. It's, it's a wonderful paraphrase. The Good News Bible is another one. Uh, that is, it was very popular amongst the, the Jesus people and for Roman Catholics in the 70s and 80s. Good News Bible is a wonderful uh, paraphrase. The message, message is fantastic because um, if you're a fan of Eugene Peterson, that's his paraphrase. Remember, when you're reading it, you're getting Eugene Peterson's theology. You're, you're not getting a translation from the texts. So, if you read it in that way, understanding you're getting Eugene Peterson's thoughts, you know, it could be very beneficial. <clears throat> now, there are there is one um, paraphrase that the author is trying to call a translation, and I, I call foul. I, I throw the yellow flag uh, on that, and that's the Passion. I would say stay away. Stay away from the Passion version of the Bible, and it's not anything against Brian Simmons, who's the author. Uh, Brian Simmons has had a, an amazing ministry through his life, but he is not a Greek scholar. He's not a Hebrew scholar. He's not an Aramaic scholar. He has not shown any credentials. He's not shown any proof that he is a uh, scholar of biblical languages, yet he says he's doing a translation and that the Holy Spirit is giving him divine guidance in doing this. What's happening with that translation is that he's putting a bunch of extra words into his translation. Um, and these extra words are reflective of Brian Simmons' uh, very hyper-charismatic uh, theology. And I'm not unsympathetic to his theological points of view. If he were to put them as notes, do a paraphrase, call it a paraphrase, and put notes in the bottom as to what he believes the translation, the, the interpretation of certain passages are, that'd well, be different. Then it might be a actually pretty good resource. But because he's putting it within the scripture and calling it scripture, I throw the yellow flag on that. That is a... Uh, that's a personal foul, 15-yard penalty. Uh, let's set the ball. That, that is not biblical translation. And uh, he's never released any proof that he is, that even knows Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic. Passion Bible, stay away from it. it it's garbage. It really is. Um, but let's keep going on. Now that we have talked about translations and paraphrases. If you're going to read and study the Bible, select, again, I'm going to go back, select a translation that you find readable, 
that is accurate and uh, like Mark Ward said, one of the good ones. So next week, when we get together, we're going to talk about genres in the Bible because the Bible isn't this monolithic. You don't read Genesis the same way you read Psalms, the same way you read a gospel. You read all of them a little bit different. So we're going to talk about genres. We're going to talk about the difference between inductive exegesis and deductive eisegesis. And we're going to finish up with some recurring themes of the Bible. So that's all for next week, and that's all for this week. You be blessed. Remember, please like this video, subscribe, and hit that post notification button. And I will see you next week. God bless.